in the previous video, we started section 2.7, which was on analyzing graphs of functions and piecewise functions. I was hoping to get through this entire section in the previous video, but it took a little longer than I expected to talk about symmetry of graphs and equations, even in odd functions, etc. So in this video, we're going to finish section 2.7, talking about piecewise functions as well as increasing and decreasing functions and local maximum and minimum. Okay, so piecewise functions or piecewise defined functions. When I was learning algebra and just going through school, going through college, I didn't take piecewise functions very seriously. And not in the sense that they're really difficult, so I should have taken them more seriously. I guess what I mean is that I didn't realize how much they could potentially be used in real life situations. But then also in the back of my mind, I, I kind of thought that if you wanted to use it in a real life situation, it would it would be kind of difficult. Seems really complicated, right? Look at look at this piecewise defined function. Just seems complicated as opposed to, you know, f of x is equal to x squared. That's nice and clean, simple. This this looks like a lot. Well, yeah, okay. As far as writing out a piecewise function, it's a lot more than, a, than just a single function, but I wouldn't be that intimidated by something like this. And I'll show you what I mean. I, I'm going to give an example in a second of how you can think about this in a real life scenario. As far as I'm going to give some examples of actual real life uses of piecewise functions. And I'm and also going to give you an example of how you can think about how you would apply it. Okay, so they give an example here of how a piecewise function could be used. It says, suppose a car is stopped for a red light. When the light turns green, the car undergoes constant acceleration for 20 seconds until it reaches a speed of 45 miles an hour. It travels 45 miles an hour for one minute and then decelerates for 30 seconds at another red light. And so you want to graph all of that and come up with a function to represent all of that. Another example I, that I like to use is think about a roller coaster. If you're going to have any uh, the an equation for a roller coaster or a function for the path of a roller coaster. Well, there's not going to be one master function that represents the entire roller coaster. You would have, it would be piecewise defined. The starting slope is linear. And then when you go from here to here, that would be a cir circular or maybe parabolic. And then it would go you know, another linear with, with a steeper slope, right? And so all, it would be, pie, it would be piecewise defined, okay? And then, I mean, it would be, it could be anything. Like you have an equation for a spiral, right? That would be like a 3D equation, but you get the idea. It's, it's piecewise defined, right? The idea of the heavy side function, it, it, it's like, it depending on if you have like the heavy side function is H of T, but you could do like t minus three. You can shift it, and it's this function is the it's equal to one when t is greater than or equal to three, and when t is less than three, this function is equal to zero. Okay, so it's like you know depending. On, but if you put four, then it would be it would it would it would be one when t is greater than or equal to four. So, but for three, one, two, three, one. That's the function. It's it's a um, it's well okay. That's not piecewise. It's kind of, it's kind of inherently piecewise, but the idea is you could multiply put in front of this function anything you want, x squared. So what what would that mean? Or t squared? Like well, this would be an x. This t could be this the independent variable is a t, but you could also put an x. But let's say the independent variable is a t, and you put t squared. Well, instead of this here, you're turning on t squared. You're turning on, it's like turning, you're turning on a function. And in re, but in real life, you know, you can think about needing to model something like that, like a light switch. It, it turns on or off. And again, this is not technically a piecewise defined function. It's kind of the piecewise nature is built in. But I'm just trying to give you a sense of the idea. You could write a heavy side function yeah, okay, so the heavy side function, this heavy side function, you could write it as in piecewise form like this. You would say, so h of t minus 3 
is equal to, and doing it in this form, it's zero when t is less than three, it's one when t is greater than or equal to three. Right, the piecewise nature is built in. So you see, but you see the applicability, uh, you know, in certain situations in, in real life, you want to turn something on or off. Or for a roller coaster, you want to, you know, from, you would have to define for the roller coaster, it would be, I don't know how you'd lay that out, but it would be, maybe it would be based on time if you're, if you're tracking the position of the roller coaster with, with respect to time. No, no, it would be, the piecewise nature will be based on position. When the roller coaster gets to this position, you switch to another function, right? When you get to 20 meters, let's say that's the position down the roller coaster. So like, in other words, and this is the position S. And so if this was an S, once you get to 20 meters, you switch to another function, to the circular function. Then from 20 to whatever, you, you do this function. Then you, after, after that 40, 80 meters, you switch. You get the you see what you see what I mean, and they and they give an example of that here when the car is going from it, it says the car stopped at a red light when the light turns green the car undergoes a constant acceleration for twenty seconds and you can think about that if they wanted to model this maybe the car is stopped at the red light and that's time zero and and then it waits ten seconds and then the light goes green okay so in other words you kind of shift this graph to the right well you could start with a heavy side function. And so it's not till 10 seconds that the car accelerates or the car, yeah, the car accelerates. You get the idea, but they're, they're, they're keeping it simple here. I, I don't want to overcomplicate this. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the applicability of a piecewise, the piecewise idea. But the car accelerates. And so it's this function here is what? The speed. Okay. The speed is now the speed is increasing linearly. It's a constant acceleration. But when the car gets to 20 meters, now it's a constant speed for, for 40 seconds. That's what this is. Then the speed is decreasing all the way back to zero from 80 to 110. I think it stops at another red light. Yeah, another red light. Okay. All right. So, great. I think you now have a sense of the applicability of a piecewise function. But how do you implement this? Right? So, like, you know, how do you deal with a piecewise function? Well, look, take a look at this. Okay, so we're in Excel, and you know how in, in Excel, if you want to, so we've got an input X, that we're the, the position of the car. That's the input. We want to give the position of the car, and it gives us out the speed of the car. Okay, well, if we were just dealing with one single function, we know how to do that. We would do, okay, equals, let's say it's just, it, it's just the, this 2.25 times x. Well, no. Okay. We want the speed. So, this is the input and, and this is the output. We would say equals to 2.25 times the position. And so, you input any x. And there's ways you can restrict the possible inputs into a cell, like in Excel, or any, you know, if you're doing this in, a, in any kind of coding software. But so you could, if you don't put in something between 0 and 110 or, or something from 0 to 110, it'll, it won't, you know, say error. But, okay, so we put 10. The speed is 22.5. And that's correct according to this diagram. So if we had 10 we would get 22.5, right around there. All right, but what about the, the piecewise function? Well, you just use if-then statements. You could use if-then statements in Excel or any, you know, any coding software is going to have, you know, you use if-then statements. Now, this isn't a course on using if-then statements in Excel. I'm just trying to just give you the idea. So you would, you would put the formula like this. So equals if... <laughs> If what? Logical test. When you put an and, if two things, if the value in this cell is greater than or equal to zero 
and the value in this cell is less than or equal to 20. Right? Then if that's true, you do 2.25 times the input. If that's false, what do you do? You do another if. If and the value in this cell is greater than 20 as well as the value in this cell is less than 80. Okay, the value, if that's true, you just put 45. If that's false, then you put... If, if, if there's anything other than X being between 0 and 20 or 20 and 80, then the only thing that's left is this. So you just put minus 1.5 times the input plus 165. That closes that if. Now let's close the whole, the, the initial if statement. Okay. So if X is 25, you just get 45. If X is 50, 54, 45. If X is 8, you get 18. Right? If X is 8, would be around here, you get 18. It would be around here. Okay, what if X is is 100 we should get something around it would be 12 13 yeah see so that's the idea of a piecewise defined function all right now if you're graphing a piecewise function then you're just it, within the intervals, you're putting whatever is said to, to put. Like, you know, within this interval, you put this line here, 2.25x. Within this interval, you just put a constant 45. Now, I'm not getting into too many details in this video of how to set up piecewise functions, but you would have to, the idea is you wouldn't put, like, this line here, okay? It's not like you're, okay, I want a line that, when X is zero, Y is 45, right? Like if, if you put this line at the, you know, you're not, you're not putting in this line. You, you have to, the, the idea is you want a line here so, so that when X is 85, you get this value. So you would have to, for like this line, you would have to extend this all the way and see what the y-intercept is. You know what you want the slope to be, so you would use that y-intercept to to have this to get this this line that's shifted all the way out here. And that it's similar idea if you're you know using any kind of so here they've got kind of whatever this curved function is, but it's been shifted out. So you'd have to you have to account for that shifting when you put this into the piecewise function. So yeah, see it's. Square, this is square root of x, but it's been shifted to the right two units. Okay, but when you're graphing these, so you put in the intervals, you put whatever the graph is for like a line or, or a square root. But then at the, 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 the interval points, an open circle means that the, the function is not defined at that point. Closed circle means it is, and that's just going to be based on the, the, equal, the greater than or equal to. So here it's just less than minus one. So on here's the the line minus x minus one, and so since it's not this point, it, this is le this is not less than or equal to. It's just less than. So this is an open circle. But for the minus three here, just a constant y is equal to minus three. It's x is it's for x is greater than or equal to minus one, and x is less than two. So you have a closed circle here and an open circle here. You see. Okay, so they, here they give some examples of graphing a piecewise function. We're going to work a bunch of example problems. Here they talk about the greatest integer function. This is kind of like the heavy side function. So where, where, all right, if you've got, so like we know this, this means absolute value, right? But there's also this idea. 
if you ever see this, I think that's what it is, like a double bracket. This is called the greatest integer function. This means greatest integer. I mean, you could do whatever. You could put this in a relation if you want. It's called a function here. Like, this is called the absolute value function. This is called the greatest integer function. But you could put this in whatever you want. If you had a circle, x squared plus y squared minus 3xy is equal to, you could do that if you wanted to. So it's not a function in this sense. But all this is saying is that whatever the input is, return the greatest integer less than or equal to this number. So if it was 4.9 was the input, it would return 4. If it was 4. Point oh, it would return 4. If it was 5.1, it re would return 5. If it was minus 4.8, it would return minus 5 because minus 5 is less than minus 4.8. So you could graph that, okay? But like the heavy side function, th this is built in as is, it's piecewise, right? This is just notation here. It's, it's like the similar idea to if you have a heavy side function, f of t and you could graph this, and you can imagine what the graph of this would look like. I mean, any kind of rounding function, if you, if you go into Excel and do round 1.2. Or no, let's do round up. Oh, it's not as too few arguments. Number of digits, three. Wait, no, I'm going to put a comma. No, number of digits, one digit. Well, okay, I, yeah, I don't know, but th there's a function that you could put in where it would round up. This, it would round this up to five. I mean, that's a function, right? You could graph that. That's a, a piecewise function, and they're calling it here, they're talking about step functions. A rounding function, that's a step function. The greatest integer function, that's a step function. You know, integer x, floor x. You know, that's all in, in MATLAB and Excel. They, there's, you know, if we come to Excel, so floor. There is a floor function. Rounds a number down to the nearest multiple of significance. Floor. So too few arguments. I don't... One, there, you, there we go, okay. So what, let's see, equals to floor of this cell. So, yeah, it's a floor, it rounds it down no matter what. And then you could have an integer, int, So, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how all these functions work, but, but again, these step functions behind the scenes is a piecewise function. That's the idea. This is, we're still in the piecewise function section. Okay, so that's piecewise functions. Now, we have a little bit more to go in this section. We want to talk about Increasing, decreasing, and constant behavior of a function. So this is pretty simple. This is just terminology, but it's good to learn the, the math terminology. Let's come here. You can specify that a function, or really any equation, but you, you can get a sense of as we go through this, it's hard to say for a circle to say that a circle is increasing or decreasing or or even constant. It's so it, you know, it just to, you, you can get a sense of how it's hard to, to talk about some of these topics if you're not specifying just a function. So if you have a function, let, let's, let's stick with a function for the moment. If it's increasing, it's a function is said to be increasing on an interval. It's exactly what it sounds like. If you have an interval where, so you evaluate the function at x, they have the interval x1 to x2, you evaluate the function at x2 and evaluate it at x1, and f of x2 is greater than f of x1. This is really simple. I, I mean, this is kind of kind of trivial, but 
the idea is the function evaluated at some later value of x is greater than the function evaluated at that previous value. But, and so that's what increasing means. But it's kind of, you, you don't want to have this. So if you evaluate the function at x2, you get a value of the function. You evaluate it at x1, you get a value. This value of the function is greater than this value, okay. But you could still potentially have like this, right? So the idea is for all x's on that interval, if you pick any x between x1 and x2 and compare it to, and, and do f of x, that value x, and compare it to f of x1, it's going to be greater than f of x1. So then the function is increasing on that interval. It's the same idea with decreasing. And you can think about the, for a constant over an interval from x1 to x2, then for any x that's greater than x1 but less than x2, if you compare f of x1 to f of x, or if you compare f of that value x to f of x1, it's going to be the same as f of x1. Okay? That's the idea of a function that's increasing, decreasing, or constant. And you, you really say it is a function is increasing over an interval or decreasing over an interval or constant over an interval. But you might hear someone say a function is always increasing. So like, for example, a, a square root function it starts off at zero and it goes, it's always increasing over the entire function domain. So you could think about it that way. Or you have a function that like the f of x is equal to x squared, well, it's decreasing over the interval from zero to negative infinity. It's increasing over the interval from zero to infinity. So just keep these terms in mind. The idea of, it's very simple, right? But increasing, decreasing, constant. That's the behavior of a function over, either over the entire function or, or if you specify certain intervals of a function. And you can see, though, if... They're, they're just talking about functions here because if you have a relation, like a circle, it's kind of hard to say it's constant over an interval or it's increasing over an interval. Over what interval? The interval from this x to this x? Well, is it it's decreasing here? It's, well, okay, it's decreasing both here and here. All right. I guess you could kind of say it's decreasing. It's still a bit abstract. You might have another relation that's, Okay, we, we looked on, on the other page, something like this. Well, okay, over this interval, it's increasing here, it's decreasing here. So it's, 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 more, it's more complicated. It's, it's, you can't really specify any hard rules when it comes to relations. So that's why they are just foc they, they're just focusing on you know, the behavior increasing, decreasing constant behavior of a function. But, I mean, if you wanted to, for this, this doesn't pass the vertical line test, but it, it would pass a horizontal line test. And we're going to talk about, in a later section in Chapter 4, the, the idea that if a, if a function passes both the vertical and the horizontal line test, then it's a special type of function. It's in, it's an invert, it has an inverse. But, okay, so it passes a horizontal line test. So you could think about, well, you know, over the interval from this y to this y, is the function increasing or decreasing? I mean, this isn't an official math talk. I'm just saying don't feel, I don't want you to feel so restricted. Like, you've got to follow the, the, the rules no matter what. Like, you can't do anything outside of the box. No, you can think freely with all this. Over this interval of x values, you can't really specify anything. You've got two different things happening. Over this interval of y values, you do have just one thing happening. So you could look at it that way if, if you wanted to. All right, relative minimum and maximum of a function. You, you, we really go into detail in this in calculus. This is a, a big topic in calculus. But the idea is if you can specify an open, any open interval on a function, any open interval, it's got to be open is the key word here. The interval needs to be open, and I'll explain why in a second. If there's a, if you can specify a single point that's greater than or equal to all other points in that open interval, then it's a relative maximum, and then vice versa for a minimum. If you can open interval and specify like, there's, a, there's a single point or multiple points 
that are less than or equal to all points within the, within that interval, then it's a local minimum. And the reason why it needs to be an open interval is because, okay, yeah, you could do a, a closed interval. And so what that means is that the open, I don't know if we've talked about this, but open would mean that your the endpoints aren't included. Here the endpoints are included. Well, all right, this works. There is this single point that is even with the closed interval, that's greater than or equal to all points in the interval. So that works. But what about this? I can specify a closed interval here. Well, there's a single point that's greater than or equal to all points in the interval, as well as a single point that's less than or equal to all points in the interval. But we're not, in, that, that's not, we're not interested in, in that. There's nothing going on here, right? The, the open interval, okay, you might say, well, wouldn't the same thing happen for an open interval? Well, no, you can't specify a single unique point I can get infinitely close to whatever this value is. What point am I going to specify? It's open. I, can, I, can, I can't specify a unique point. Well, you might say, well, what about the point that the interval is defined? That point's not on the interval. That's, that point is not included. Where I drew the parentheses, that, that, that value is not included. So I can't specify a unique point. So there's no local max or min in this interval. And then just to point out, technically, by definition... If I've got a constant function and I specify an open interval, technically every point within this interval is a local max and min by definition because every single point is greater than or equal to all other points in the interval. And every single point is also at the same time less than or equal to all points in the interval that, by definition. But that's kind of a trivial example. And also if you've got, so you might have, you know, something like, Okay, the endpoints, you can't, the endpoints don't count for local maxes or mins because I can't specify an interval around this point. You have to be able to specify an interval around the point, an open interval. And so that's what, I'm calling it local max and min, but also they're calling it relative max or min, same thing. Relative max or min or local max or min. We go into this in a lot more detail in calculus. Let's see, I can also, if, if here's another case where if you have a piecewise function, okay, well, I can specify an open interval around this point, and this point here, it's defined, is less than or equal to all points within the interval, so this is technically a relative minimum. But if it's not a piecewise function like this, if it's a, 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 a curve, a continuous curve that you can draw without picking up your pen off the page, then the the local or relative maxes or mins are going to be at either these peaks or valleys like this, or, or a or a peak or a peak or valley that's like this. One of those two. If it's not piecewise with like a jump in it like this, if it's a a curve you can draw without picking up your pen off the page then the local maxes or mins are going to be on something, one of these two, a peak or a valley in, in this sense, a smooth peak or a smooth valley or like this one with a, with a kink in it like that, right? Open interval, this point is greater than or equal to all points in that interval. Okay, let's work some example problems.